Welcome to the OMM Medicines module on physiologic cranial conditions. So before we talk about any of the actual cranial conditions, we first need to discuss what the SBS or the sphenobasilar synchondrosis is. And simply put, this is the articulation between the sphenoid bone and the occiput. And in terms of OMM, this is where the majority of the motion for cranial OMM is going to occur around. So what is the sphenobasilar synchondrosis or the SBS? And as you can see, we have a disarticulated skeleton here with many of the bones removed. But from this point of view, the SBS is going to be this articulation between the sphenoid and the occipital bone right here. And this is going to be the major location of motion for cranial OMM. I also want to go through two key terms in cranial OMM, and the first is the biparietal diameter, and all that really means is how long are the two parietal bones together in this direction, in the horizontal direction. And so if you were to increase the biparietal diameter, you would make the head a lot wider. The second major term is the AP or anterior posterior diameter and that is basically just the distance from the front of the skull to the back of the skull here. The first motion at the SBS that we'll talk about is SBS flexion and SBS flexion occurs when the sphenoid bone is going to also flex and the occiput is going to backwards bend or extend. And when all of these motions are occurring at the SBS, it's going to cause the paired bones of the skull, which are the bones in the skull that there are two of, like the parietal bone and the temporal bone, to externally rotate. And a relatively high yield topic to remember is that external rotation of the temporal bone for any reason is going to cause some sort of complication or lesion, likely of cranial nerve 8, and will talk about this a little bit more on the next slide. Now there are two kind of measurements that we talk about with motions at the SBS and those are going to be the AP or anterior posterior diameter of the head and the width or the biparietal diameter of the head and both of these will change with various motions at the SBS. So in SBS flexion the AP diameter is going to decrease and the width or the biparietal diameter of the head is going to increase. And what you're left with is this kind of short and elongated football-like head, which looks like Ernie from Sesame Street. And it's kind of key to remember because test questions commonly like to ask, hey, SBS flexion is occurring. How is the head going to look, right? And you need to know that the AP diameter is going to decrease and the biparietal diameter will increase. So the final sequelae due to SBS flexion is going to involve the sacrum and the dural attachments to the sacrum. And what will happen is that the dura is going to be pulled cephalader upwards towards the head. And if you imagine that the dura is attached to the anterior portion of the sacrum, this is going to pull the sacrum up and it's going to make it rotate backwards or extend, also referred to as counternutation. And if this isn't very intuitive to you, you can just imagine that sacral motion is always going to be opposite the motion that occurs at the SBS. So when the SBS flexes, the sacrum is going to extend and vice versa. Now let's look at SBS flexion. And remember that the SBS is the articulation here between the occipital bone and the sphenoid. And in SBS flexion, the sphenoid is going to flex and the occipital bone is going to backwards bend or extend. And so the motion at the SBS is going to look something like this. It's going to open up. Now let's look at how the parietal and temporal bones, or the paired bones, move with SBS flexion. And so SBS flexion alone will look like this. Right, because the sphenoid is flexing and the occipital bone is extending. And so the paired bones are going to externally rotate, and it's going to look something like this. So now that we've discussed how the paired bone should move in an SBS flexion, it should make sense why the biparietal diameter will increase in an SBS flexion. And that's because when 
the paired bones externally rotate like this, you're increasing the distance between the two parietal bones, shown in this peach color and gray. And so again, external rotation of the paired bones will look like this, and that's the motion that occurs in SPS flexion. And when you do this, it increases the distance between the two parietal bones, therefore increasing the biparietal diameter. Now, a very high yield point for the cranial OMM section is that when the temporal bones are externally rotated for any reason, but SBS flexion would be one reason they are externally rotated, it can present with a cranial nerve impingement, and it's usually going to be cranial nerve 8. So if you see a patient who has some sort of hearing issues or tinnitus ringing in their ears or gait abnormalities from balance issues, then you really want to consider that they may have some sort of externally rotated temporal bone. And that is the reason that they are having this cranial nerve 8 palsy. This is a very high yield point, so really remember that external rotation of the temporal bone for any reason can cause a cranial nerve 8 issue, and that you will see external rotation of the temporal bone in an SBS flexion. The first in-depth cranial motion that we will talk about is a cranial torsion. And by definition, a cranial torsion is going to occur when the sphenoid and occiput rotate in opposite directions. And this rotation is going to occur around a single AP axis. And the way that we name cranial torsions is going to be for the greater wing of the sphenoid that is higher or superior. So if the sphenoid is higher on the right, it's going to be a right cranial torsion. And if the greater wing of the sphenoid is higher on the left, it will be a left cranial torsion. Something that is commonly tested for the cranial OMM section is how do your hands move one in the vault hold for the different cranial pathologies. And so for each of the different cranial motions, we're going to go through and talk about what the expected hand changes would be for a cranial torsion or one of the other cranial OMM pathologies. So for this example, let's talk about the hand changes we would expect for a right SBS torsion, right? And the right fingers will come up, the right palm will come down, and the left hand will do the exact opposite. And this should make sense to you, because in a right SBS torsion, the greater wing of the sphenoid on the right side should be superior. And if you're palpating the cranium correctly in the vault hold, your fingers should be on the greater wing of the sphenoid. So it would make sense that your right fingers will come up. And you can imagine that this motion where the right fingers come up and the right palm comes down and the left hand is going to do the opposite. It's kind of like opening a bottle cap where it's a, almost as if it's a twisting motion of the two hands. Now let's look at the hand positioning for a cranial torsion, specifically a right cranial torsion. And in a right cranial torsion, the right fingers are going to come up and the right palm goes down and the left fingers will go down and the left palm will come up. And this hand motion should make sense because remember in cranial torsions, the sphenoid and occipital bone will rotate to opposite sides, and we name the cranial torsion for the side that the greater wing of the sphenoid is higher. So in a right cranial torsion, the right wing of the sphenoid is going to be superior, and this makes my fingers that are palpating the greater wing of the sphenoid also move superior on the right side. And on the left side, these fingers are going to move inferior. And then we find that our palms are going to do the reciprocal motion. So when the right fingers move superior, the right palm moves inferior. And when the left fingers move inferior, the left palm moves superior. The next physiologic motion of the cranium we'll talk about is side bending rotation. And this happens when the occiput and the sphenoid are going to rotate in the same direction, but side bend away from each other. And these will be named for the convex side or the side that has more of a fullness to it on palpation. It's kind of the larger side. And side bending rotation is going to occur around three total axes. And those are going to be an AP axis, which is the same that we saw on the torsion. And it will have also two vertical axes. This is where the side bending 